You would stay standing as you are for our scripture lesson today, which is from the Gospels, so we want to stand. This is from Luke 10, 1 through 9. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and a place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, and therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. I'm sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter first, say, peace to this house. And if a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Um, well, friends, it's um, we've been in this journey for this past couple of weeks talking about answering God's call. And, and today I want to close this, this series of conversations with um, talking about witnessing. Uh, we, in this journey, we have learned several things about answering God's call. And one of the things that I've been insisting with you that I hope that you're taking with you is that answering God's calling is a process, not an event. It's the way that we live our lives. It's the way that we interact with one another. It's, it's, it's a series of small adjustments, small tweakings in, in our daily life, in the way that we see the world, in the way that we interact with the world around us, in the way that we, that we interact with people around us, that these are responses to God's calling for us. Yesterday, I had a privilege to, to talk to a uh, class of folks who are in the course of, for their, uh, one of the classes for the lay servant uh, certification, and we're talking about God's calling, and, and how sometimes we think of God's calling just as God calling somebody to ministry, to be a pastor, or God's calling someone to be, uh, uh, to be in a stage somewhere, or for this big, major uh, kinds of work, but, but I understand, and we talked about this in our first sermon series, that God is calling all people at all time for this many different things, for many different actions, and then it's, it's, it's our response, it's the way that we live our lives that respond to God's calling, it's the way that we are, are in this dance sort of with the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit leads us, and we respond, and we do something here, and something there, is a words of kindness, and words words of affirmation and, 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 and moving away from old practices and, 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 and turning closer to, to spiritual practices and, and focusing on our spiritual disciplines and allowing this to, to change the way that we talk and we see the world and interact with other people. This is the way that we answer to God's calling. And in the context of talking about God's calling and answering to God's calling, we talked how this answering can be individual. We can answer by ourselves or we can answer as a community. And when we start thinking about our community, we talked about the vows that we have, that we made when we became members of the United Methodist Church. And specifically, the vows to answer to God's calling, the vow to support the church, to, to serve in the world with our prayers, with our presence, with our gifts, with our service, and with our witness. And today, as I conclude this series of conversation, I want to focus on witness, and we are going to talk about the big E word. The E word. Sometimes we don't like to talk about the E word in church, but today, if you pardon my language, we're going to talk about the E word, and that is evangelism. <laughs> right? 
So, so I, I, there are several images of evangelism that we have. And then I, I, saw, I brought some pictures because maybe those are the images that you have of evangelism. There's a first one here. Maybe when you think about evangelism, this is the image that comes to your mind. Depending on which church you grew up in, what was the experience of church that you had, evangelism may be somebody angrily screaming at the corner of a street saying that if you don't turn to Jesus today and repent from your sins, you're going to hell and talk more about hell than heaven. Maybe the image of evangelism that you have is the second picture. Maybe a group of people insistently knocking at your door, and uh, uh, j just like the Jehovah Witness, and, and I grew up. <laughs> I grew up in this in this in, in 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 an area that every now and then the Jehovah Witness would come in and people and the kids when we were playing in the street and the Jehovah Witness when the street in the back the word would go out so everybody would go inside their homes and close the door and say the witness are here the witness are here maybe that's an image that you grew up with with. Uh, thinking about evangelism, that people bothering you and knocking at the door at all time and, 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 and disrupting your day and people very inconveniently talking to you. Or maybe there's a last one. Maybe the image of evangelism that you have is someone holding a pamphlet in the, as you're trying to get out of the grocery store saying, if you die today, do you know where you're going to or do you know where you're going to spend eternity? Maybe when you think about evangelism, some of these images will come to your mind always more negative, always talking more about hell than about heaven, always wanting you to do a lot more than actually offering you something and proposing something that is of any benefit to you. It's always something that you have to give away, something that you have to stop to do, but usually never about what you gain when you give your life to Christ. And so when I think about evangelism, I love to go to Scripture and actually find out what does the Bible tell us about evangelism? What does the Bible tell us about witness? What is the model of Jesus Christ of sharing our faith with one another? And so at this point, the, God, the, the image of the gospel reading for today comes to my mind. The gospel reading that we had for us today tells us that the, at the moment of the ministry of Jesus, when he decides to go towards Jerusalem, Jesus started his ministry by calling the disciples, inviting people to follow his ways. He's disclosing more of himself to them, inviting them, investing in them, inviting them to follow him. And then he heals people. He changes the life of people. He starts telling people of, of a better way of living their lives. He starts to give hope to people. The message of Jesus in the beginning of his ministry has nothing to do with hell or with condemnation, but it has to do with hope. It has to do with restoration. It has to do with transformation. The message of Jesus is a message that invites us to live a better life. It's a message that invites us to get in tune with the plan of God for us. It has to do with, with the plan of God for us and the will of God who is pleasing, which is acceptable, which brings joy and comfort, moves us away from the path of sorrow and death and brings us into a path of love and union and fellowship with God and with one another. And Jesus then goes around the region preaching this message, touching people, healing people, meeting people along the way, meeting their needs. And at one moment, the gospel uh, uh, tells us that Jesus sets in his mind to go to Jerusalem. He knows what is going to happen in Jerusalem. He knows that he's going to be crucified. He knows that death is awaiting for him at Jerusalem, but he also knows that through his death, he'll bring life. Through his death and through his sacrifice, we will have life. We will have full transformation. The kingdom of God will be open for us. So Jesus sets his way to go through to Jerusalem. And so as he is going to Jerusalem, he decides to get the back roads. He doesn't get the highway or the main road, but he goes through the back roads, stopping at city after city, touching people, healing people, instructing people teaching about his message of love, teaching about his message of transformation, teaching about the kingdom of God. And so as he is going, he sends them the disciples ahead of him to prepare the way, to prepare the cities that he's going to go into, to start preparing the way for his coming in. And this is where I learned which Jesus 
strategy for evangelism, Jesus' strategy for witnessing, Jesus' instruction for disciples then and for us today on how to do proper evangelism. By seeing the command of Jesus, Jesus commanded the disciples in his evangelism strategy to build relationships wherever they go. The strategy of Jesus for evangelism, the strategy of Jesus for witnessing, it's not just to knock at people's door and go from one home to another, just to tell people what, what they wanted and without offering anything of substance. The strategy of Jesus is not sending the disciples and say, repent now or you go to hell. The strategy of Jesus is not to send the disciples to bring condemnation wherever they go. But the strategy of Jesus is to send disciples to build relationships, go into the cities, go into the homes. When you get there, don't jump from one home to another, but stay at the home that you get into. Knock at their door, yes, and get to know them. Get familiar with them. Hear their story. Know who they are. Show interest in who they are. The strategy of Jesus is not of, of exchange. You give me something, and I'll give you something back. I'll give you this candy, and you come to my church. I'll give you this food, and you come to my church. I'll give you this Bible. I'll give you this gift, and you come to my church. The strategy of Jesus has nothing to do with response in the first place, but has to do with us showing actual interest in the life of people, us actually wanting to know who they are, what their struggles are, what they're going through in life. It's not a transactional strategy. It doesn't work only if people come to the church or only start following Jesus. Only if they do what I want them to do, then the evangelism was effective. But it's a strategy that causes us to show actual interest to people. Actually loving people, actually listening to them, paying attention to them without having any agenda behind it. I spend time with you and I want to listen to you because I value you. Several people call this the strategy of Jesus a relational evangelism. A evangelism and a witnessing that is based on building relationships. Not trying to use people for their money or for their attendance in church or for any other benefit that they can give, but it's actually seeing people for who they are and valuing them for who they are, a beloved child of God. Strategy of, strategy of Jesus actually focus on people. Go figure that. Jesus actually wanted his disciples to get to know people, to meet people, to value people, not for what they could give, not for what they could do, but for who they were. Imagine what that would do with our church. Imagine what that would do to Christianity around the world if we would focus on people, if we would value people for who they are if we would spend time listening to them for who they are, if we would love them for who they are, not because they can give us something back, not because they will make our church fuller, not because they will make our budget healthier, not because they will make, us our, make our life easier or open other doors of connection for us, but we will love people for who they are. This evangelistic strategy of Jesus centered in relationships. The goal is to meet people, to love people, to show that they are valued, to show that there's something important in them. And then, once we hear them, once we get to know them, then we start sharing our faith with them. We start sharing what the Lord has done in our lives. Then, and some people will say, when you earn the right to speak, then you share your faith. Then you say, hey, this is how I practice my faith. This is what the Lord has done for me. This is the church that I attend. And when I go to this church, I'm surrounded by people who also love me for who I am. They know that I'm imperfect. They know that I don't have all things right. They know that I struggle at times, but they still pray with me. They still love on me. Then once we get to know people and allow them to know who we are, we can openly share about our faith.
That is very different from screaming from the corners of the streets. That is very different from approaching people in the, in the, in the door of the grocery store. That is very different from knocking at people's door and just handling a pamphlet and vomiting everything that we have learned and memorized in Sunday school. That is actually getting to know people. Just like Jesus did. Jesus did not come from heaven and just say, this is the gospel and this is the kingdom and now if you believe or don't, good for you or bad for you when you're going to hell and I'm going back to my home. Jesus has spent time with us. Jesus so interested in us. Jesus wanted to get to know us. He spent time meeting with people, going to weddings. This is, this is the gospel. When you hear the gospel, there's a bunch of stories about how Jesus went from home to home, from town to town, getting to know people. This one time that Jesus even healed the, uh, Peter's mother-in-law. I found it so interesting, the detail that the gospel tells us that Jesus was so involved in the life of his disciples that it was not only about them, but about the connections that they had and about the families and friends, siblings. Jesus was inviting people to relationship. And through that relationship, restoration flowed. Through re that relationship, transformation flowed. Through those relationships, then a conversation about faith arose. I think it's... Hmm. I was going to preach a completely different sermon today. But I think it's so interesting, and, 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 and this, is, this has been my prayer this week, that um, that sometimes we don't preach the gospel really because we believe in it, or we don't uh, uh, employ our efforts with evangelism and witnessing because we believe in it, but there's always a hidden agenda behind it. Either we, we want our church to be full, that's why we invite people in, or we want a Sunday school class to be full, or we want a project that we are working on to have a lot of people. And there's always this, this thing about metrics, that only when we have a lot of people, if we have a certain number of people, then the event was successful, or if we don't have that number of people, then it was a failure. And it's always about counting how many people are there, or how many I don't know if we're good friends enough for me to use that expression, so I'll try to do kosher. How many hindings we have sitting on the cushion of the church. And the message of Jesus has nothing to do with how many people are sitting in church on Sunday. How many people do we know? How many people are experiencing transformation in the community? How many people are actually getting to know Jesus Christ? How much, how deep people are knowing Jesus? It doesn't matter if there's only five people or 500. Are we experiencing the love of Christ? Are we experiencing transformation in our lives? Are we experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit flowing in us and through us? And that cannot only happen with a five minutes encounter, with a 10 minutes conversation at the bus stop or at the, at the checkout line. The ministry of Jesus is about relationships. How we build relationships. I think it's interesting that, that Barnabas, one of the, 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 the greatest evangelists that the New Testament um, tells us a story about, he only evangelized one person. It has nothing to do with anything that I wrote on my knows for today, but, but Barnabas, the, 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 the scripture tells us about the story of Barnabas once Jesus was dead and, and resurrected and the community was flowing and Barnabas, he went out of his way and he went and traveled. God knows how many hours and how many days to find one person, to minister to one person, to develop relationship with one person. Who was that? Paul, one person. By developing relationship with one person, now we have a good chunk of the New Testament, now that the, the we have a, a good understanding of Christ, who Christ is and the work of Christ and who we need to be as a church because one person decided to spend time evangelizing, building relationship with one other person. We have no idea what God can do through our relationships. We have no idea the power that is spending time with someone listening to someone, hearing their stories and telling ours with no other agenda, with no other intention other than meeting that person and seeing who they are. 
how much I pray for a church that will invest in relationships. How much I pray for a church that, that, that will stop looking at those metrics and how many people attended Sunday and how many people were in this. Or, or, and we'll invest in a church and, and build a church of, that will focus on how many, what was the depth of, of, of the transformation? There's this one family that, was, that, that, that their marriage was falling apart and then because the church surrounded that one family, their marriage was restored. There's one person who was struggling with addiction and the church prayed for them and the church surrounded them and then now they're set free. What if we focus more on the stories of transformation? What if we focus more on what the Holy Spirit is doing rather than focusing on what is the number or the budget or what is the bottom line or what, how much money we're making or how many people are coming to church? Hmm. Well, I'm going to leave you alone now. I deviated so much from my sermon, but I think the message that I want to convey to you today is this, that, that the kingdom of God is about relationships. And my invitation for you is that. Build relationships. Don't be so eager in, in finding what the other person or the people that you're sharing your life with or sharing your faith with can be, give back to you, but what if? We valued people for who they were. What if we followed the example of Jesus who sent the disciples to go to homes and spend time there and pray with them and share their faith with them and touch them and heal them? Not anxious about what the kind of response that they would give, but in what we can offer. I think by doing this, we'll follow the example of Christ. By investing in relationships, we will do what Christ commanded us to do. Open our hearts, open our eyes, open our hands to serve. Not to expect something back, but to give of what we have. To give what we have received from the Lord. And in a day like this, where we come to the table of fellowship and for the table of love, we're reminded of what Christ gave to us. Christ gave to us all that he had. Christ gave to us all that he was. He just invited us to develop a relationship with him. So let us be the church that do likewise. The church that invests in people. The church that invests in relationships. No matter what the other people can give us back. Because they're focusing on what we can give, what we can offer. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.